Okay, so I'd like to introduce Dr. Simon Bratton, who's very kindly joined us today to speak to us about the history of the NHS. Um, Simon is a consultant, a pediatrician, and also clinical director of child health at King's um, College Hospital. He's very passionate about education and training and um, is involved in both local, regional and national um, training and education uh, with regards to the school as well as um, the college. So um, thank you so much, Simon, for joining us today. Oh, thank you. That's got to be about the nicest introduction I think I've ever had. So thank you. Um, so guys, I'm giving this talk from home because um, if many of you have tried to do Teams meetings from your office recently, with many other people doing Teams meetings at the same time, it's quite challenging. So the reason why I'm telling you that is that if someone knocks at the door, my dog will bark and I may have to go and um, and um, help help him out. Um, so um, I'm, um, I'm impressed by the number of people that have arrived. I did kind of deliberately choose the most boring title for this talk. Um, and um, I should have called it the history and the future of the NHS. Um, uh, and we'll touch on a bit of that and possibly have a bit of debate because obviously the future is um, unclear at the moment. Um, and this is a talk that I've kind of grown over the years, um, delivering it as part of the MSC in um, Advanced Pediatrics via KCL. So hopefully um, it will go well. And um, then um, Ayn's going to watch the questions coming in and we'll take questions at the end. So hopefully technology works. OK, so what we're going to cover is a brief history of the NHS up to the current day ish. Um, we're going to have a bit of focus on child health. I mean, not really um, so much in the slide content, but probably more in the stories that we talk about, especially at the end. Um, I think a key point to take away from this talk um, is how the NHS and kind of major organisations really going through a significant period of time do appear to not learn from previous mistakes. And um, I'm sure you'll see examples of that during this talk. And then we'll probably talk a bit more about what's going to happen post COVID. And um, you can have my thoughts on that if you like um, at the end. We'll see how we go. So, um, so there was life before the NHS. Um, as you know, the NHS came into existence in 1946. Um, but um, we'll just briefly talk about life before the NHS because I think people will reflect on the future and they'll talk about the NHS before COVID. Um, so, um, so in the 1930s leading up to the war, healthcare systems across the UK were um, very variable across the whole of the piece. There were independent hospitals that were somewhat privately run and funded. There were some individual and small group GP surgeries, and then there were voluntary organisations. But the key thing is, is there was no central organisation. So if you wanted to open up a um, you know, a cardiac service next to another cardiac service, for instance, I'm sure they were pretty rudimentary in those days, um, you could do it. There was no um, monitoring of competition, etc. Um, the government kind of realised that it was sitting on a bit of a gem here, that it had um, some excellent um, possibility of providing a really organised healthcare service across the NHS and wanted to, um, to go on to um, to kind of pull all this together into a fully organized NHS and was talking about this in the mid to late 30s and was thinking about how it would go around it and then the war happened. So um, so during the war obviously there was a huge amount of um, injury and healthcare burden for the healthcare service that was in existence at that time. And what the healthcare providers demonstrated was that they were able to um, to change very significantly. And it's like, you know, I think we've all felt that we've gone through that in the last three months where we've all demonstrated in um, the organisations that we're working in that we can change um, amazingly in three months. I mean, who would have thought a year ago that we would have been through these last three or four months? So. Um, so the healthcare providers did demonstrate that they were able to pull out this significant change, get on with it, provide high quality healthcare, um, but they were still doing it within their own um, kind of funding governance structures. So um, 
So this geezer, William Beveridge, um, Anurin Bevin gets all of the credit for um, creating the NHS. But actually, if I was to say who was most responsible for creating the NHS, it would be, be this man, William Beveridge. Um, I was lucky enough to go to his granddaughter's wedding in the Scottish borders um, many moons ago. Um, she's a paediatrician, at least she was. Um, and he's um, he was a clever geezer. Um, so he... Um, was educated in classics and mathematics at Oxford, um, got you know, a first class degree, um, very sensibly tried out law and then realized that wasn't for him. Um, he then went to try to gain a bit of experience in life and started working um, in particular, looking at the social injustices around um, unemployment. And in 1909, he wrote, um, unemployment a um a problem for industry and this was a real um kind of seminal book really which kind of um described um the impact that unemployment has on society um and he was very much described as a scientific reformer who um was genuinely concerned with um the economic and social impact um that the health of the nation um could have, and, it, and it, you know, in, in particular for moral reasons. Uh, and then from 1919 to 1937, he directed the London School of Economics. So um, clearly a very, very bright chap. He then became a civil servant. And, um, and in 1941, I'm just going to see if I can change this. Um, oh, have I, have, can you guys still see or not? Um, in 1941, um, he um, he was asked to commission a report into the healthcare system and how it should be organised. Uh, and he pulled this together in 42, called Social Insurance and Allied Services. And he recommended that the government needs to fight the five giant evils of want, disease, ignorance, squalor and idleness. And um, they perhaps wouldn't be our five giant evils now, but they're not far off. Um, you may rename them slightly differently, um, but I think they're probably as applicable um, in today's society as they were then. He talked about funding and that it would have to be, um, there would be a weekly contribution to the state. Um, and um, in return from this contribution, he would fund the NHS. Uh, pay benefits to the unemployed, the sick, the retired and the widowed. And he wanted to ensure that there was a minimum standard of living in Britain below which nobody fell. And in particular, he recommended care from the cradle to the grave, which is the first time that that kind of um, concept was, um, was created. So, um, so why was this done? And, you know, I think the politicians realised that um, the gains that were to be had through having a properly well-funded and well-run NHS, and they thought, well, good health is a right. They knew the existing services were, while there was some brilliant um, clinicians, they were actually very disorganised and ineffective. Um, the voluntary hospitals were underfunded and were unable to provide the same quality of care as the funded, more private institutions. Uh, the Second World War had demonstrated that there could be an effective emergency medical service and the um, healthcare system demonstrated it could rapidly respond to massive change. And the younger um, members of the nursing and medical profession um, felt that there was a better way of doing things that would be more fair for everybody. Here you go. So there's the NHS bill that was um, that was created in 1946. And as you know, that was delivered by... Um, and Erin Bevan, who is also an amazing chap. So, um, so published in 1944, um, proposed the creation of the NHS with local and regional boards and was further clarified in 46. And um, I don't know if you guys know, but the very first patient to be treated on the NHS was a teenager with liver disease. Um, that was the first NHS patient. Um, so, um, and Erin Bevan, um, pushed for free health care paid for by taxation and um, I think the NHS did kind of the people behind the NHS the civil servants did think that by putting money into health care that we would make the health care population more well 
and in the long term it would cost less, which was a bit naive. Um, teaching hospitals governed themselves at that particular time, but all hospitals were nationalised. Uh, he created this idea of merit awards for those providing very good leadership. Nurses were regulated by the Royal College of Nursing and hospital doctors were regulated by the Royal Colleges. Um, importantly, GPs continued to be regulated by the BMA and, um, and the GPs were not employees of the state, but instead they were paid for um, per capita for the, for the population of people that they actually provided healthcare to. And that, um, that's remained somewhat true up until quite recently. So, um, so Bevan had um, some fundamental questions that, um, that he thought um, would need to be asked. And uh, I think if you look at these questions, they're as valid today, if not more so than they were in 1946. How should we organize and manage the service? How are we gonna fund it? How are we gonna balance the conflicting demands and expectations of patients, staff and taxpayers? And how are we gonna ensure that finite resources are targeted where they're most needed? I'm sure you'll agree that those are the, clearly the four main questions that we still need to, um, to grapple with for a really well-run, organized um, NHS. And Bevan, who was um, a kind of champion of most professions, but certainly the nurses, um, said at a Royal College of Nursing conference, we'll never have all we need. Expectations will always exceed capacity. The service must always be changing, growing and improving. Again as relevant today as it was then. So 5th of July 1948 was the, when it first started providing health care to patients. Um, provided free health care at the point of delivery funded by central taxation. No government since has come up with an alternative solution despite trying desperately to come up with one, especially um, Margaret Thatcher who we'll touch on in a bit. Um, and, uh, and it remains the, um, the same, essentially the same structure. Um, today as it was then, but obviously on a much bigger scale. So, um, so as I said, in the early years, they thought that um, costs were going to go down rather than up. Um, and um, they thought that healthcare, when it improved, um, that, um, that there would be less demand for, for more healthcare. Um, clearly um, naivety there. Um, and in, they realised pretty quickly that they were running out of money. So even just the following year, a prescription charge was introduced um, for those that could afford to pay. And in 1951, dental and optical charges were introduced. So already we're moving away from a fully funded NHS to, um, to a mostly funded NHS. And the budget during these years um, remained at £400 million. Pounds. Um, which was quite a lot of money at the time, um, and we'll come to um, what percentage that was of the um, of the total budget for the country in a bit. Um, and in um, in 1956 was the first proper review, and they realised that the NHS was grossly underfunded. There were no strategies for raising money other than more taxation. They realised at that point costs were going to carry on going up rather than going down. And, um, and the current expenditure was too low to provide a high quality service. So um, some of you might remember this guy, maybe not um, personally, but you certainly would have heard his name. So, um, so if you think about the kind of structure of the hospital system around the country, most small to medium town has got a DGH. And these were created in the early 60s by um, the health minister, Enoch Powell, who um, perhaps wasn't the nicest person in the world, but, um, but did do some useful things. Um, he carried out a comprehensive review of the NHS and um, he recommended a more population based approach to healthcare and set up these DGHs, which were funded by an area health authority. And each, um, each DGH um, and Area Health Authority looked after about 150,000 people. So there's about six to 700 of these DGHs throughout the country when they were created, and obviously um, there's a lot less now, now about um, 260. Um, GP, yeah, that's in total. So GPs were, um, were also rewarded financially for local practice development, 
Um, and um, one good thing Enoch, Enoch Powell did do was close the mental health asylums, but he started that process in the mid 60s, but it didn't actually finish until the 80s. He was the person who was in charge during the thalidomide scandal, and I don't think he covered himself in glory in the way he dealt with it. He basically said it was um, each individual's personal responsibility, and if anybody took so much as an aspirin, they put themselves at risk and they needed to carry out their own research before taking it. Not the most um, empathic approach to um, what was a massive healthcare scandal. Um, but the area health authorities were more local than previously and more organised. And slowly but surely, they realised that they needed to combine the idea of a clinician, um, a head nurse, and some managerial capacity to be able to function um, in any way that we would sort of think is normal for today. So uh, you recognize, recognize this lady. So she came to power in 1979, um, and allegedly um, in the early years, there was a paper that was leaked which was discussing privatizing the NHS. Um, it created such a negative stir amongst the populace that it was scrapped before it ever saw the light of day. Um, and here we see the kind of next major um, reorganization of the NHS. So, um, so area health authorities, which were quite small, um, were abolished and more um, simple local boards were created. And these were called district health authorities and they had much bigger population that they looked after. However, as we see when we get to the graphs um, in a bit, um, spending on the NHS reduced in real terms. Um, so in terms of the GDP, the, the spend on the NHS was reduced significantly during this time. There wasn't a really any, any investment in the NHS and uh, there was a look for efficiency savings, which basically was the same thing as cuts. And that um, impacted significantly on um, productivity and performance. And, um, so yeah, so difficult years for the NHS definitely during those years. Um, but she appointed this, this guy, Roy Griffiths, who um, used to run Sainsbury's. So clearly absolutely the right person to work out what's wrong with the NHS because he can run a supermarket. But he, to be fair, he was a good manager. Um, and um, he recommended that, um, well, I think he identified that the managerial bandwidth and capacity within the NHS was um, was limited and the people were found it difficult to make um, managerial decisions and keep try to keep emotion out of it. So um, he recommended that managers should be recruited from outside the NHS um, and they should be paid according to performance. And um, so here we saw the beginning of what we now call general management coming into the NHS. This is still before the creation of foundation hospitals, but it was the beginning of hospital management. And um, he said, if Florence Nightingale was carrying her lamp through the NHS today, she'd be searching for the people in charge. Um, and um, some of the people on the call may remember what hospitals were like in the mid eighties. And um, I think probably a fair reflection. Um, and he said the NHS didn't um, have any real continuous evaluation of its performance against business criteria. Not surprising, given the, the length of time that cuts were taking place during this time. There was great variability in levels of service. There was no benchmarking. Um, the, um, there was no attempt to look at a cost improvement, productivity, motivating, rewarding staff, and research and development was um, disorganized. Um, there were precise objectives for management were rarely set and there was little measurement of health outcomes. If at the end of each year hospitals were in debt, they were just their debt was essentially paid off. Um, but um, they were it was very difficult for the hospitals to actually you know get that money paid off and then so there was significant cuts that was um, that were happening. Um, and there was yeah no evaluation of clinical practice and quality and effectiveness at the time. So, um, so John, the John Hopkins Institute um, in 1972 proposed this, um, this model of a clinical director, um, a, a lead clinician working alongside a manager, um, and then um, eventually that kind of evolved into including heads of nursing. And, um, and this model was, um, was championed in the UK um, initially at um, 
what was the sort of guys in St Thomas's um, hospitals, UMDS. And Professor Sir Cyril Chantler was the person that introduced that into those hospitals, and um, and that has become the standard um, way that we run the NHS now, and the standard way we work as clinical triumvirates with a head of nursing, clinical director, and a and a general manager leading each department. Um, so um, so these were organised. Um, the idea was that the clinical director would provide the clinical leadership to the clinicians. The, um, the head of nursing would bring along the, um, the nursing team, but the general manager would be the budget holder for the directorate and um, would, um, would, would, would look after the money side of things so that the clinicians could just focus on the clinical side of things. Um, but as I said before, it was difficult for a hospital to actually go bust. So there was no, um, even though there was a massive drive to cut down funding, um, it was still difficult to run these organisations as a proper business in a business term. So, um, so we're now moving out of, um, uh, to towards the end of kind of Thatcherism. And... Um, and the internal market, which was the um, Conservative government's attempt to address problems such as growing waiting lists, well, the idea was that it would help to create a bit of competition um, and, um, and it would lead to a more responsive NHS, hopefully fostering innovation and um, you know, the best organisations would rise to the top and would provide the best service and the less good organisations would, um, would be less able to keep up with what the top organisations were doing. And so it actively encouraged competition. Um, I think if a lot of us were going to go back and think about how we would reorganise the NHS, this is probably one area that we would want to have a bit more of a think about. And um, I won't go through this slide in too much detail, but um, you know the the internal market was created, which led um, to the creation of hospital trusts. And, uh, and in the first wave, there was 57 NHS trusts that came into creation. But by 1995, all healthcare was provided by trusts. And each trust had its own board and was executive and non-executive directors. And they were in charge of their own budget and they weren't bowed out if they went into debt um, to the same extent as they were previously. Um, and they were more independent organizations. They're working within the internal market. There was competition between these organizations. GP fund holders also um, happened at the time. Some of you might remember. So there was this two tiered service to GP practice. Some of the GPs actually held their own budget and were responsible for how they commissioned their own um, health care for their patients. And other GPs carried on in the standard um, system through their NHS um, sort of commissioning. It did lead to this two tier um, system, which wasn't particularly fair and was a bit of a postcode lottery about what you could get um, at any time. Um, and also at this time, private providers um, started to come more into existence and they were given more access to the ability to actually um, take on healthcare. So moving on, so Labour now, um, in May 1997, Labour back to power and Frank Dobson brought in his paper, the new NHS, Modern Dependable. And, uh, and one of the things was going to be payment by results. So this, um, you've heard of HRGs, so this healthcare resource groups, which are groups of um, lists of diagnoses from the ICD-10 code currently and from other um, coding systems. And um, hospitals are paid um, in bundles of healthcare for their HRGs, which are linked through these payment by results. Um, it, it didn't. It certainly didn't get rid of competition, um, and um, has le has led to ongoing competition. And there is also um, fudge factors for wherever you're working. So if you're working in, you know, central London, if your hospital's in central London, you get a um, increased fudge factor for your money you get paid. And say if you were working in Swindon or Bath, so the amount the fudge factor you'd get would be less because all the overheads would be um, would be less. Um, sorry, a long, boring slide. Um, 
it, it's there for you to look at and um this is what i've just talked about really which is these hrgs and um, the development of service level agreements and this is what's led to um to the way we talk about commissioning now um so for those who are um familiar with commissioning there's commissioning's kind of in two main systems so the um so, so the nhs um, specialist commissioning service um is what commissions um anything which is a sort of national or a regional level service and then locally commissioned services which tend to be um in what we would call like a bundle um it is what's paid for the local patients that you uh, that we look after they are looking at getting rid of the um, specialist commissioning services um system in the next year or two um because it possibly um so it's a way of getting more money into certain hospitals um but it's i think covid has possibly um changed changed that certainly for the short term so um so payment by results is what's led to the way we think about commissioning now and um and this idea as i said about um either bundled healthcare commissioning which is by local systems or by nhs specialist commissioning which is what occurs um, nationally so for instance you know the liver transplant service at king's or the you know neurosurgery service or cardiac service wherever you are would be specialist commissioned as is neonatal care at the moment, although neonates will be going into locally commissioned stuff. So briefly talk about regulation. Um, and um, so regulation was identified really um, in the 80s and 90s as being important and was um, tasked to by the Royal Colleges. If you look at the um, Mid-Staffs Review, um, you know, or the, um, or the Bristol Inquiry, which obviously were later than this, um, they um, were certainly very critical of the regulatory organisations that were in existence at the time, in particular the Bristol Inquiry, where there was no triangulation. That was even more so in the um, Mid-Staffs Inquiry, where the, the lack of talking to by different um, regulators and different organisations was abysmal, really. Um, so, um, so you've heard of the CQC, clearly. Um, and um, as an independent regulator of all health and adult social care. Um, the, um, the aim of the CQC is to make sure better care is provided for everyone wherever health care is being provided. And it actively engages with providers and commissioners and, and fr from everywhere from care homes all the way through to um, you know, tertiary level hospitals. And um, over the years, the CQC has, has um, started to have more teeth and the ability to um, to actually lead to closing down of services that are um, deemed unsafe. So Foundation Trusts, 2004, slowly but surely got created. Um, they were initially, um, there was a difference between Monitor and um, um, and the NHS Regulatory, well, there was another organisation, I can't remember its name. But anyway, they've now been pulled together into NHSI and NHSE. Um, so the five-year forward view um, for those of you um, most of you are familiar with this came into existence in 2015 by Simon Stevens who's the head of the NHS and um, really wanted to look at improvement in same-day emergency care improvement in cancer survival focus on mental health um, focused on integrated care working across boundaries between primary secondary and tertiary care started to talk about these organizations called STBs so sustainable tra um, transformational plans, um, ACOs, um, so accountable care organisations, ACSs, accountable care systems, all complicated um, and acronyms to describe a system that wasn't particularly um, effective, um, certainly nationally. It was, it was effective locally in certain places. Um, big focus on prevention. So if anybody's been to their GP recently, the GP expects you to look after yourself to a much higher level than perhaps they did 10, 15 years ago. Um, funding was um, a major issue during the five year forward view. Uh, the idea was to reduce waiting lists. If you go through the entire, the entire five year forward view, the word child was only mentioned eight times. And it was mainly around obesity, eating disorders and mental health. 
clearly it was implied that paediatric care was part of many other aspects of the five year forward view, but it was um, the word child was um, definitely missing. So now right up to modern day, so the 10 year long term plan published last year, um, thankfully is much more child focused than is focused on the whole life from fetus to old age. Um, and the idea is making sure everyone gets the, um, I should say best start in life, not best start in life. Um, and uh, delivering world-class care for major health problems. Um, one of the things, if you, um, I think if you were to go and ask the average person in the street how wonderful is the NHS compared to all the other healthcare systems in the in the world, many people would think it's the um, it's the best. However, if you look at our cancer outcomes um, in adults for um, compared with our European partners. Um, out of about 21 countries across the whole of Europe, our cancer outcomes certainly are in the bottom 40% of those. Um, they are improving, but everyone else is improving as well. And um, so um, there, I think there is lots more to be done and hopefully the 10 year um, plan will help to uh, address some of those inequities that we have with our European partners. So um, the idea is to support people to age well um, mainly focusing on prevention and tackling inequalities, supporting the workforce and better use of technology. And, um, and so the STPs have now moved to integrated care systems. So you may be familiar with ICSs. So I'm most familiar with the um, South East London ICS. So we previously we had six PCTs for each of the boroughs, um, but now um, Lambeth, Southwark, Greenwich, Lewisham, Bexley and Bromley, I think that's it, um, are, um, have formed together into um, an ICS. And um, the idea is, is that the ICS will be able to focus on the population health for the whole system um, of all the people it's working with, but also work with the NHS trusts um, and GPs and mental health and community providers and voluntary organisations to pull all this together into a package um, which provides best health care across, um, across the system. They're young, they've only just come into existence in April this year, so just during COVID that was um, a challenge for them undoubtedly. So as I said, um, finances. So if you go back um, right to the beginning and um, so 1945-ish, you'll see that initially we started off with about 1% of our GDP being put into the NHS. Uh, that kind of rose all the way through to about 1980 and then you can see the Thatcher years uh, where um, the funding decreased significantly from um, from sort of 81, 82 all the way through to about 90. Then you see the Tony Blair years um, coming in later where funding went up significantly and at the top where you can see the plateau um, that's our most recent um, um, period of time where you can see um, healthcare has not increased um, in terms of funding for the last um, seven years or so. To be fair, it has increased this year significantly, unexpectedly. Um, so um, but that's um, funding. And, um, and if you look at our um, the amount of money we spend on our healthcare system compared to um, European and world partners, so we're the purple line, and as you can see, we spend um, significantly less in terms of GDP than um, than any other country on that organisation. Uh, ironically, the United States spends the most, um, mainly on insurance companies, and um, possibly has the least effective of all the healthcare systems. So if you were going to choose one from there, you'd probably go for Germany and Switzerland as being the models of choice. So, um, so as I said, we'll now talk a bit briefly about COVID. Um, so the thing about any um, kind of crisis is that um, the um, imaginative managers um, at the top level of the organisation see it as a lever to push through pieces of change that they've been wanting to push through for a long period of time. And there is a temptation for that to happen and you may be feeling that in your own organisations. Um, as you've probably heard, lots of changes proposed. Um, I think the key thing is, is that in all these periods of change, we make sure we've got the right people at the table so that we're focusing on making the changes that will provide the best healthcare for our patients and not um, just because 
we think it's a good thing. I've been trying to do it for a long time. Um, so talked a bit more about the ICSs. I think the ICSs will be um, probably more effective um, if they're able to do everything that it says on the tin. Um, you guys know very well what's happened during COVID and the effect it's had on training and the workforce and morale and um, exhaustion and infection, etc. And now all the distances with um, all the problems with social distancing, maintaining healthcare at work and looking after your colleagues. You've lived through that and are coming out the other side of the first peak. Um, what we don't know is what the second peak and what the next big peak will be like. Um, that's a bit um, it's a bit difficult to make plans when we can't um, exactly predict, but we are predicting that this winter is going to be a, a significant challenge. So what will the future look like? Well, um, we can guarantee it will look different to what it is now. But I think um, and hopefully it will continue to be decided by um, the right people. So I guess um, my challenge to you is um, we need to work out who's going to be the next William Beveridge to um, to bring all to, to really make the best solutions for us and for our patients and um, get people working most effectively together. So there you go. Um, that's the end of my talk. I do have a video um, if anybody has the um, uh, time to watch it. But if if it doesn't work and if technology lets me down, it's basically it's um. In fact, I might just um, direct you to it. Um, it's, it's on the King's Fund. And if you type in the um, structure of the NHS on the King's Fund um, uh, webpage, there's a four minute cartoon which um, really summarizes nicely um, the, the kind of current structure of the NHS, but it's already out of date. So it only goes up to about 2019, beginning of 2019. So it's already out of date. Um, so there you go. So, um, any questions? Thank you so much, Simon. That was um, really interesting, actually. And uh, you definitely know the subject really well um, because there's lots of various bits that I feel I've missed um, along the way, which um, has been highlighted. So, thank you for that. Um, I'm Not sure the there'll be <laughs> many questions. Um, but if I could start with one, just to get um, everyone, um, give them some time sure. to type their questions. It's just, how do you think um, in the in the short to medium term, um, in the next of probably you know three to five years, how would the current pandemic affect the NHS um, in terms of, I know funding has increased unexpectedly this year, um, yeah. We welcome that, obviously, but how is that really going to affect us in the next few years or so? So I think it's a it's something that we're all looking for the answer to. Um, and um, so most healthcare organisations at the moment are tackling to get ready for the next surge, stroke super surge. So they're looking at increasing significantly the number of intensive care beds that they've got in each organisation and their ability to cope with flow through the emergency department. And there is a big focus on um, adult um, healthcare, which is um, does possibly lead to people taking their eye off the ball from paediatrics. But of course, what we've seen recently with you know, the PIMS, et cetera, um, that has put the focus back onto paediatrics. And uh, we I think it's up to us as leaders to make sure that child health remains at the forefront of every, every kind of clinical decision that hospitals make. But predicting the future, um, so I think, um, you know, the, if you think the government has had to pay an enormous amount of money for, um, for keeping the country going, at some point someone's going to have to pay for that and there'll be some balancing of the books. So I, th I do think funding will reduce um, eventually, or at least um, not increase perhaps at the same pace it has over the last year. Um, and um, I look at I think networks of care are going to be absolutely essential, and I think um, I think it's really up to us as clinical leaders to be brave and to make the right decisions for um, our patients across the whole network, and not to be um, not to be driven by our own um, needs within our organisations, but to focus on healthcare for our patients across the 
the whole region. Thank you. Yeah, I hope that um, instead of trying to manage the current issues, we don't let our eye off the inequality and um, uh, all the prevention medicine that we should be um, doing. And as we have said in the in the ten year plan, that we will um, be going forward. Thank you, Simon. Absolutely. I think there's a question there from Janani about. Um, so, do you think the current bureaucracy and management structure in the NHS is too complicated? Thus, more money is going to paying management and PFI rather than the clinical care itself. So, I think the answer to that question as clinicians is always yes, um, and the answer to that question as a bunch of managers is probably no. Um, and um, but it is um, very complicated. Um, but I guess that's not surprising, bearing in mind it's a £120 billion pound, um, industry now. Um, so, um, and we as clinicians, um, we, 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 it's, it's essential that we're involved in decision making that uh, impacts upon patient health care. But we're not um, the best uh, managers and decision makers in terms of finance for the, for the whole country. Um, so. Um, so yeah, so I, I I think it's always tempting to to think that we need less managers, but actually the further you go up the tree, the more you realise that um, most of them are working extremely hard and adding a huge amount of value to our um, healthcare system. Thank you so much, Janani. I hope that has um, answered your question. Um, are there any other questions from the rest of the? Thank you. The rest of the team. I've got, well, a comment really about um, your first few slides about the questions on how best to manage the NHS and the four or five things that are um, yeah. were asked then as a, as a challenge and um, are still very, very relevant now. Yeah. Um, whilst it's whilst it's comforting to know that it's very relevant still now, it feels like um, are we any closer to finding out where the balance might be? Have we figured out maybe the micro aspects of it, if not the whole bigger picture? I think those questions are always going to be valid when you've got a system that's paid for by taxation and um, and provides healthcare for a whole population which is free at the point of free and in inverted commas at the point of delivery so i think those questions will always be um, important and valid and actually they're really important questions to keep going back to to um to having a think about are we doing the right thing um not just for um, ourselves and our patients but for the whole population so i guess it um it, ju it just shows what um amazing um Kind of politicians and civil servants that we had at the time who realized they were the important questions and how valid they are now i i think we will be thinking they're as valid in 20 years as they are now sorry i'm not sure if that's the um the answer you're after but it's um it's my opinion no i completely agree but i suppose you if you can look at it from a glass half empty or glass half full perspective i suppose because yeah. um uh, there's still the questions and there's still the balancing acts that we're trying to get right. Absolutely. Um, there's another question from Chantal. Um, he says, RCM are keen to avoid overcrowding going forward, which had become a standard part of emergency care. Do you think this will be possible? And could this be at the expense of paediatrics? <laughs> So I think anywhere where you've got um, patients waiting, it's going to be a massive challenge going forward. And um, all organisations are looking at how they organise um, outpatient clinics, how they organise radiology appointments, and how they organise emergency department waiting times. Um, and um, it is going to be very challenging to maintain um, effective social distancing within organisations to help us to provide. It's going to be challenging enough just for the for the staffing in the offices that we've got at the moment, we're going to have to look at whole new ways of working. Um, but every hospital is looking into this. Um, so there are local um, London wide and then there are national um, guidelines on how hospitals are organised into 
you've probably heard of green and blue zones. So green is um, COVID uh, minimized and blue is COVID managed. And, um, and you're looking at how you organize your healthcare systems and trying to have the best possible organization that you can have, but um, everyone's going to struggle with with this despite the best organization that, that we can have especially through the winter um, and i think we have to fight and make sure it doesn't um affect children you know this is um or at least no more than it affects anybody else but you know each child um comes with a parent which makes social distancing more challenging with a small waiting space and um we're going to have to look about how we um how we make that work and, sh and also share I think it's a really important for us to share our um, solutions as well as our problems with each other so that we can learn as quickly as possible. Thank you so much, um, Simon. I, um, I completely agree. I think there has been a lot of sharing of information actually about how yeah. we are restructuring and how uh, we are responding to, to what's happening. And that's um, amazing to see how people are working closely Absolutely. together nationally yeah. and internationally i think we'll take saskia's question thank you saskia as, as probably oh we've got a few more minutes actually so saskia says there's been huge amounts of supports for nhs staff during this covid period yeah. and the well-being of staff is more considered now do yeah. you think this will be a sustained change in the nhs gosh um i hope so i am um, so the um you know, they've stopped the thursday clap now haven't they which is um uh, and and I, I, you you kind of wonder why they stopped it. Was was it a political agenda to to stop that um, that feeling of public appreciation of um, you know all um, essential workers, but mainly healthcare staff? Um, I think people's um, perceptions in society has changed um, quite a lot, and they do realise even more about how important healthcare workers are. Um, um, and everybody who works within healthcare organisations, how important they are. So I hope it's a sustained, because um, you, you, I think you've got to hope for some silver, silver lining around any cloud. And if we come out of this with um, society being a more appreciative place and um, respecting everyone who provides essential services, then I think at least that's something. So um, I'm um, optimistic about that, at least in the short term. Thank you. Um, I, I am optimistic too. I think, um, yeah, I think uh, I think that's a balance between sort of mental health and well-being, and and the pressure of thinking of yourselves as or being regarded as the hero and having to um, put your, your your needs and your family's needs and your personal needs and your colleagues' needs um, aside and and to plough through, but also balancing that with um, you know doing as much as you can in a time where actually you know your work is really important and it's much appreciated by um the general public and population yeah for the first um nhs clap i had um, covid like many people on this um phone call and was moderately unwell and um i remember um kind of I reflected on facebook and i kind of said um well i don't really understand why we're getting thanked at this time we, this is what we do 24 7 365 this is why we go into healthcare this is our job um but you know many thanks for your um, gratitude and you know feelings of um expressions of um wanting everybody to be as good as well as possible but it was a real um it was a bizarre experience for me experiencing the clap having the um having covid feeling unwell thinking why i got the infection etc so um but and i'm sure we're, i'm sure many of us went through that experience at that time Thank you for sharing, Simon. I think, yeah, I think there's a, there's a mixture of emotions about um, the clap, um, and that probably changes as as it went through. I think there were a good eight weeks or nine weeks or so that we had it. Um, but um, I, for one, think it was a right right decision to um, <laughs> to stop it because otherwise it'll just peter out and it'll be a yeah, bit that's of a true. Sad death. That's true. Um, are there any other questions or comments from um, those who are who have joined us today? Thank you. 
So there's a message from Chaucer Ward saying, much agreed, thank you. Very useful historical perspective and insight. Good, thank you. Thank you, Simon. Do you have do you have anything um, else to say, or could I also ask um, for the link um, for the um, video that you're about to show? If you don't mind um, posting it on the chat, that'd be fantastic. Yeah, I will. Um, I'll forward that to you. Um, and if anybody wants, um, you know, to get more involved or whatever, then um, you know, I'm happy to be contacted. Um, S. Broughton at nhs.net. I may not be able to do it myself, but I'll um, I know somebody who um, can um, can help with um, taking any of these interests a bit further. Perfect. Thank you so much, and thank you everyone for joining us. Um, the session will be on YouTube, and also please um, remember to fill in the feedback form and make full use of the learning packs. Um, thank you so much, Simon. Hope the rest of the day goes well too. Yeah, no, thank you. I'm a dog didn't bark. So there you go. Cheers, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone.